I believe we are live. Live. I think I we're live. Several buttons oh saying we're live. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. So um, this is the Beth and Kelly show. You uh, might have thought that we disappeared, but no, we are now broadcasting live on a Wednesday on a different platform and with a bunch of awesome, awesome, knowledgeable folks. And um, we are just so excited to get into it. Um, today, we are going to be talking about keeping your music program relevant and navigating budget cuts and shortfalls. Um, this is kind of an advocacy chat that we're going to have. And we are um, really talking to the many teachers that both of us have encountered in our work life who have been telling us stories about changes, cuts, consolidations, program eliminations. Um, and <clears throat> we're here to um, hopefully provide you some amazing ideas, some hope, some to do's to keep you going um, as you enter the summer and get ready for next year. Mm. Kelly, you want to talk about our yeah, no doubt, no doubt a topic that is very emotional, uh, just devastating. And um, we are hoping to um, sort of help you wade, pull yourself out of the <laughs> out of the um, tailspin and provide some uh, action items. Some action items, some fire. We wanna, mm. we wanna light the match that gets your kindling going, um, putting Ooh. it in camping term, terms. Um, yeah. And when we were talking about having a show about this, um, we reached out to some partners um, who have very graciously and we're very excited to um, contribute their brain power and their time to this en endeavor. Um, this is, you know, a kind of a quad partnership with Music for All, the American String Teachers Association, Seattle Jazz Ed, and of course, this is um, a production um, of WNEA, the Washington Music Educators Association. And we are grateful to all of these organizations for coming together to support teachers and their students. Yeah. I think we better get into it, bro. We have a yeah. stacked program. Hey, we got a stacked. Us. It's us. This is Kelly and I at WNEA 2022. In we Yakima. ordered the same thing, which was we ordered fun. the same thing, and it involved fried bologna. I'm just saying, <laughs> it involved fried bologna. Okay, um, so we are going to be your moderators. We are hosting a talk show today. If you've never seen the Beth and Kelly show, we like to be conversational. Um, we like to laugh. We like to keep things fun, um, and. We will be hearing from all of our um, all of our panelists just kind of as a talk show. So I would like to introduce our panelists, and we're going to have them introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Lynn? Thanks, Beth, and welcome, everyone. Hi, Lynn Tuttle. I serve as the executive director and CEO for ASTA, the American String Teachers Association, and grateful that I could be part of tonight's webinar and talk show. <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy Earnhardt, President and CEO of Music for All. Uh, we are a nonprofit scholastic music education, advocacy, and events organization dedicated to building leaders, celebrating teaching, teachers, and the art of excellence. Whoa. And I'm Ron Gerhardstein. I work at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma. I'm the Associate Director of Bands there. But more importantly than all of that, I serve currently as the President of the Washington Music Educators Association. So I'm here representing WMEA. And thanks, Beth and Kelly, for having me here. Yeah. So we would love for you to be typing your questions and thoughts into the chat. 
Um, and you can, we will also be watching the socials and gathering your um, chats, or your comments and questions. And we are going to circle back at the end and try to answer as many questions from folks as possible. And the amazing staff at Music for All is watching these chats for us and helping us gather all the questions. So please, please do not hold back. We want you to type your questions um, <laughs> and comments. We want to hear from you. And I would like to uh, right now thank We've got several staff members from Yamaha on the call right now, and we are just so thankful for them as supporters as well. Thank you, Yamaha folks. Hi, Heather. Hi, Dave. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's get into it. Um, let's do it. We've been, all of us, all of us on this call um, are have been fielding several um people's questions, um, comments, please for help. My program was removed, reduced, rejected. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. And um, when we gather together to talk about, um, you know, how do we help folks? Um, we kind of landed on, like, we need to get our verbiage together. Mm -hmm. We need to have in our pocket something to say in some cases it's not too late for example i was pulled in on um a really gnarly cut that happened at uh washington middle school where beth and i used to teach together where the um jazz program was being cut and there were lots of press about it and upset families and I just found out a couple of days ago that they've put point two back into the WMS gig so that there will be jazz. Okay. So Perfect. it is That's possible right. to um, make a sound, <laughs> make this, you know, make something happen. It is possible. Um, and so part of what we want to talk about is like, what do you, what, what can you do or say? What are the words so that you can try and save things? And that it's not too late and that we always need to be ready. Sometimes it's hard to have those words at the ready. So yeah. I would like to ask Jeremy. Jeremy's got the words. Jeremy's got the words. <laughs> Jeremy. So I think the first key thing is that music advocacy is a health regimen or an exercise regimen rather than an emergency room visit, right? So we really have to be thinking about the long game and Lynn Tuttle will be speaking to that a little bit later. But what I've found is that it's important to be able to have words that speak to your community as Beth and Kelly had alluded to uh, a little bit earlier. And I know that Lynn is gonna cover that as well. Here are things that have worked in places that I've been over the years, and then you can adapt in the ways that work best in your community. All of these uh, thoughts will be in the form of articles and PowerPoint resources that are available on the links that came either preceding or after, so that you don't have to write anything down. It'll all be there uh, for you. So uh, here is the elevator pitch. Strong music programs increase the bang for your educational buck. They have high potential student teacher ratios. They're required for graduation and they help increase attendance rates, graduation rates, and test scores. In other words, strong music programs are a high yield investment in our students, schools, and communities. And generally, if you got something like that in your pocket, you're gonna have their attention to be able to talk about the specific thing that is really mattering to your kids and your situation. Uh, I have over the years been in situations where the discussions were about music education cuts and with some of the tools that are available uh, on those resource pages, we were able to change the conversations from cuts to music expansion, especially as it relates to school resources. Most people don't realize that enhancing or expanding school music programs actually is a cost benefit to the school system. And cutting music programs, especially at the point of entry, has a negative cost implication on the school district. 
Some of the resources that we've provided are John Benham's Music Cuts in Reverse Economics. And I've kind of reframed that as music expansion and enhanced economics. And some of those articles have some of the thoughts and words that you can use uh, over time. Uh, just throwing it back to you, uh, Beth and Kelly, for any yeah. questions. Well, I mean, I was just, you know, when I was listening to you talk, um, we as music educators sometimes don't um, own that we could have skills in other areas. Um, and the way I was kind of hearing you talk, I was thinking, you really just got to, you got to get business-like. Mm -hmm. This is a business transaction. It's like, we got to be able to talk about the money. Um, and being able to share this compelling data that actually like just cuts to the chase of the bottom line, the money, um, to the people in power, to the admin, to the decision makers. Um, and just having that information and being able to say, no, actually, and just be ready for that. You know, another thing to be cognizant of are what types of book study books are your administrators using? And common authors such as uh, Dan Pink, Sir Ken Robinson, and Eric Jensen are very powerful for you to be familiar with because you can mm -hmm. have those conversations with them that they're being forced to have in their own professional development. We have a video in the resources from Dr. Eric Jensen, who is a leading authority on arts education and poverty education. And this video is one that we took of him at a school district poverty uh, in service for uh, in Irving, Texas years ago. And he said we could use it as long as it said ericjensenlearning.com on the bottom of it. And it sure does. It is 11, sorry, it is one minute and 11 seconds that the message is arts build a better brain. And everybody can just use have that. that at your fingertips. Yeah, that video is fantastic. I've seen yes. it several times. <clears throat> yeah, Jeremy, what I loved about your speech is it's so short. It's concise and short. It didn't you don't go on and on in your elevator pitch? Well, there's a reason they call it an elevator pitch because unless you're at the elevator on the library of the University of North Texas, you'd have a lot longer. <laughs> but generally. <laughs> Uh, you don't, and it is short attention span theater in the United States of America. So yes. look, look them in the eye, have it to say, and be well rehearsed. Yes. So, so um, there's always the, the need for um, having like verbiage in your pocket ready to go for the moment that you find yourself in an elevator with your boss or uh, walking down the hall or whatever. But it's more than just like quick one-liners that we need. We need an actual strategy. So Jeremy, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about, you know, like a grassroots building a strategy for making change toward getting back to uh, what we need to get back to. Um, you know, a lot of what you're describing has to do with coalition building. And I think that that is part of what Lynn is going to talk about. So I think Lynn is going to be invited to the conversation. Unmute, Lynn Tuttle. Yes, yes. All right. So Jeremy, where do you want to go first with coalition building? Where do you want me to start off? Please. Um, I was just going to uh, say that one of the um, sort of I think hidden secrets that people don't really think about when, as music educators when we get ready to do this advocacy work is we actually have the toolkit already. Um, and part of that is because we do our work in ensemble. And I think advocacy is always best when done with others. Um, and that's where you build that coalition. And so think about all of the, um, the people in your community that are impacted by your program, right? So as Jeremy knows, it's going to be your students, it's going to be your parents, it's going to be uh, music industry partners, um, it's going to be um, the teachers down the hall um, and across across the hallway and down down the corridor from you. Um, it's going to be the places where you take your students to perform, the senior centers, um, the town uh, town square. Maybe you do a Christmas tree lighting every year. Um, maybe you perform before uh, the Veterans Day celebration for your community. Um, think of all of those places where 
the music that your students make touches the lives of your community and reach out to those people to be partners with you in this advocacy work. Um, oftentimes mm. it, it can be hard as a teacher to make the case because people think maybe erroneously you're just talking about saving your job, but you, um, you may help, you may be able to help people sort of break down that barrier, lower that barrier of skepticism if it's someone else carrying forward that lovely elevator speech that Jeremy shared. You know, and we are so focused on the music aspect of it as well we should be. That's our lives, that's our degree, that's our what we live and breathe. Uh, if we think about it, about walking across the hall from the band room to the chorus room to the strings room and that happening, and then thinking vertically with your feeder programs. Absolutely. But also thinking about activities generally. Imagine a world where you had athletics and you had the music and the performing arts folks all together in lockstep about voting in a local ele election. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking. Um, so this is like right along Kelly's and my lines. Um, Kelly, I don't know about you, but I when I was hearing them talk about this, I was thinking about collaborating with your community is actually good for the kids too. And it should be a part of your mm -hmm. curriculum. And I think Kelly's having some uh, tech difficulties. Kelly, did you hear me say that? I think she is. But so back to the back to the panel. Um, <laughs> Co collaborating with our community should be an actual like part of our curriculum anyway. And it seems like if we're authentically collaborating with our greater community and having involvement in our greater community, they're going to be more likely to want to advocate for us in collaboration. Absolutely. And if yep. we, you know, move into this next slide with uh, the win, win, win strategy, focusing on the students and then to the teachers and then to the system. So secondary music is completely unique in the scholastic space. Generally, you have a system of adult stakeholders who are charged from recruitment out of the elementary school to completion of grade 12 in a vertical school within a school. And that's part of the conversation that is needing to be had with campus and uh, uh, central administrators is to that we can't be thinking, shouldn't be thinking, they do, uh, building to building, we should be thinking of a vertical school within a school, again, from recruitment out of the elementary school to completion of grade 12, and think about FTE allocations as part of a pyramid or a cluster, rather than just individual allocations on a personing table. Yes, and just the whole collaboration thing, um, it just is so, so important. Um, Kelly's having a tech breakdown, but um, I, I do want to share like a little bit about um, about my, uh, my collaboration with Kelly. Um, the two of us were the music teaching team in a building. Um, and I wanted to do something that was completely out of the box. Um, I wanted to start a string jazz program. And I had advocated for it for several years before Kelly came on as the teacher. The school itself um, had a long tradition of jazz excellence. But when she um, heard what my desire was, she decided she was going to collaborate with me and that if we advocate together, we might just get what we want. And she and we did. And we did. You can hear me. I know we can. Okay, you're back. And so you, you now know the, the uh, story I'm telling where yes. we advocated and finally the principal said, okay, I'll give you one part, one class in your FTE where you can have a jazz orchestra. And we became one of the only places in the country that had a during the school day, non-classical string orchestra. And it flourished for the years that we worked together. Um, and that is just one way of exemplifying how when you are collaborative, 
your voice is stronger to the powers that be. Things can happen. Yeah. Things can happen. Really cool things can happen. And also, yeah. I think the flip side of that is that, um, or maybe a related idea, I think the more we get stuck in this, this is how it has to be. It has to be this orchestra feeding this orchestra and it can only have these instruments with the, and we're only playing this music. And the more we think like that, uh, I think the it we're sort of forecasting the future. Um, you're every time you say something like that and dig dig your dig your heels, heels <laughs> you are moving away from collaboration. Um, yeah. So Kelly could have said, um, "No band." instruments only play jazz they are the only ones that are allowed to play jazz and she could have said i'm not willing to go to bat for you on this one but instead she went to bat on me for the for this one or with me for this one i and thought it was weird when you first yeah. suggested it i was like hmm what are these kids gonna do after that like what are they feeding what's the what are the of course. Outcomes? you know of i course. We, we, and we talked through those together and, uh, but at the I, end of the day, it at was the end the of the day, right I, think, I think it impacted those kids and their, their future lives so much, even though they didn't have something to go to later, um, in high school. Um, and you know, you, you went the extra mile. I mean, you could have said, I'll go to bat for you, but you're on your own for finding rhythm section players, but no. We completely shared rhythm section players. We completely shared everything and it was 100% equal and it created a revolution in our school. Um, so we just, we want you to think out of the box. Um, and so can we go to the next slide and Ron, you're gonna share some stuff about you know, trends in education, trends in music education, where are we heading and how do we have to think about it? Yeah, you bet. Thank you so much. I love hearing about your collaboration all those years ago with the jazz orchestra. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's yeah, it's so terrific. So especially through the, the pandemic, um, I was thinking about this, this first one here, new course offerings in music and just thinking that, you know, most likely we're going to lose, we're going to lose students. And of course we did. That, that's, that was the reality. And what was, I think, really nice in many communities is that we kind of had a grace period from, from COVID for a while, but that, I think that grace period is clearly over. Oh, it's, it's over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this idea that we need to find, we need to be thinking about, okay, so if my position is cut or I need to, I need to make a little bit of a pivot whether that pivot is small or that's, or that pivot is quite, quite severe. How can you pivot so that you're still teaching music? How can you pivot so that you're still building capacity with, with musicians, music making, music learning at your, at your school rather than, so when, when, if your administration comes back to you and says, how about teaching math or history or leadership or PE or, or whatever, you can come back with, how about guitar class? How about mariachi? How about modern band? How about um, I'm a high school band director. We don't really have an access point for beginners. How about a beginning, a beginning class? And um, so getting creative that way and figuring out what you can do. And I think when we get so stuck, I, th I think um, both Beth and Kelly, but Jeremy as well mentioned this, that we get stuck in our thinking of this, this is my job and anything outside of that is, is such an assault. And I can't, I can't think, I can't think beyond that if, if, if a change is coming. But that just doesn't do us any, any good. And from my personal experience, I was primarily a high school band director, but I taught guitar classes, both beginning and advanced level some years. And I loved it. Um, it was so nice to not have the performance pressures to just teach music and just learning about music and uh, learning with those students together. I and the, loved it too. <laughs> yeah. And the students that I saw would were not the students who would take band, choir, or orchestra. It was a different yeah. set of students and my administrators loved it. They absolutely loved it. And so that was really a great thing. I wasn't able to maintain those courses all the way through my career because essentially an FTE cut in another area 
kind of brought me back to full-time band teaching, mm -hmm. which worked okay. But in the end, it um, caused me you to feel- You missed it though, I bet. I, I really missed it. And actually, yeah. I was so much busier. Mm. There's, there's, I think there's issues of burnout when we're, when you have so many more students. And so it was smaller class sizes. It was less performance pressure. It was, it was really great. And there are lots of lots of ways you can you can find new new courses. Um, welcoming me. Yeah, go ahead, Beth. Oh, well, I mean, I was just going to bring into you know our realm here the national standards, which are the artistic process. It's like we all say we want to be bringing in the national standards. These classes these new classes that you dream up, opportunities for learning, these things could be steeped in responding and creating and connecting. Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, I could talk for hours and hours about, you know, what, why do we not talk about the actual music industry in any music class in a school? Uh, we could have a music industry um, course that teaches kids about the back end, um, publication, um, recording, um, recording, event, Ske event organization, you know, all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. scheduling radio a gig. DJ. <laughs> I mean, there's like a whole world of music and career professions yeah. in music that music ed in the schools does not seem to ever touch on because we're so busy unpacking Mahler. Like we have to, you know, we, we, we feel it's important that we, you know, that we play this, you know, crazy. Chike five. Chike five. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I think we could be turning kids on to music and to be um, workers in the music professions. A uh, not better. only could we be, but we should be. I want to also highlight that I heard, uh, Ron didn't use these words, but I heard Ron saying that he situated himself as a learner alongside his students. Yes. We are, yeah. we are career music professionals. You could pick up the guitar on the first day with the students and still have enough knowledge to teach that class. It's okay. Can and yeah. have. That's what yeah. I did. It, it, my first day teaching mm -hmm. guitar was my first day playing a guitar. So, and um, I played a little bit beforehand, but my students would come and they would learn licks from some tunes that we were learning, just like pop tunes. We were playing the chords and they'd learn a bass line or they'd learn a little turnaround hook or whatever. And we'd teach that to the rest of the class. Yeah, and nice. the kids, cool. the kids are great teachers. Um, and there's so many educational ways that we can um, enrich music education by thinking out of the box, not just to save jobs, not just to, you know, still be employed, but this is what needs to happen anyway. These, these are the directions that music ed are going. And the, the resources that are available today are so much better than they were even just 10 years ago. It's so amazing. much better. Yeah. Like I, I wish at the time that I'd known about modern band because I would have been way into it, but um, yeah. So an another point here, uh, welcoming beginners. So just access point for beginners, whether that's in our middle school programs, in our high school programs, um, it can be a little bit messy, but finding a way to get beginners started. I have heard some stories about teachers after the pandemic, they had low enrolled classes and they found a way to, to bring in beginners and they either had student mentors, they got some mm -hmm. extra coaching from nearby college students, they helped offer some master classes themselves to get the get the students caught up. But um, just finding ways to you've bring already them got the gear. You've it's already sitting got on the shelf. <laughs> yep. yep. And I love it that where I live here in Tacoma, there are some school districts that have dedicated classes for this, and they have for years. I love seeing that. Until I moved here, I'd never I'd never seen that. So I, I think it's really great. And I've heard teachers before just say, you know, if you didn't start in fifth or sixth grade, kind of like. Your, your time's done. Like you, you missed it. And I, I just think that's. Yeah. We, we no. got to st stop the carousel as Bob Morrison would say and let more, let more kids yeah. on. Right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Give them well, the opportunity. It is generally speaking, a true statement. If you don't get that instrument in your hot little hands in fourth or fifth grade, there are in most 
large programs, no entry point. And it's a real shame. And I can tell you in my work at Jazz Ed, where we do start beginners, um, how many parents ask if we would have this class for grownups mm -hmm. because they really wish that they had started. And I bet you that they felt that way in their later years of high school um, and might have taken that class then. Yeah, there you I go. There's a recruitment strategy. Invite parents into your space to also learn. For real. There we go. There we go. <laughs> when I was a high school band director, I went to my principal and said, here's the course that we would like to offer second chance band. Whether you were in band and got out, come back or come back and learn what you want to learn. And he wrote on an index card, no brainer, handed it back to me. And the next year, that's a class that was at. Nice. That's so great. Or like that's play awesome. the instrument that the EIM teacher wouldn't let you play. Yes. Woo. You know, how many girls got stuck with a flute, even though they chose something else? It's heinous. Well, and, contact and, me on the daily. <laughs> and just thinking, Kelly, about those, those kids that you know who might be great music teachers, you mm -hmm. want to get them playing a variety of instruments, right? You want to get them out mentoring. What a great opportunity for them to share what they already know and then for them to pick up a new instrument, too. Yeah. Just like we can do. Yeah. Absolutely. Then this last idea, number three, outside the box participants. So this is really what Jeremy just said, you know, second chance uh, band, choir, or orchestra, find a way to bring them back. So whether they didn't get a, a start in the first place, or maybe they played in middle school, you're the high school teacher, they played in middle school, but they, they quit after the seventh or eighth grade and they, you've never seen them. Chances are those students are still friends with the students in your high school ensembles. They hang out together. And if they, if they walk through your classroom, you'll, you'll see that. And um, one of my one of the favorite things that happened to me in my public school years was I had a student join the high school band for the very first time when she was a senior. And she had played before, but, it, you know, she had quit. It had been about four years since she had played and she came back. Uh, she played in the marching band. She played in the concert band. She was best buds with all the students. It was awesome. It was just so great. Fired to have, up. Yep. Just to have a student there for the joy of making music um, collaboratively with her friends and in the ensemble, it was, it was really great. So. It's just wonderful. I mean, I honestly don't care if the person is at the point where all they're doing is holding the instrument in the proper way and blowing air through it and <laughs> marching. Like, let's get them suited up. They are in the band, you know, let's do it. You know, something um, else to mention is it's okay to be in multiple music programs. And they're yeah. like, no, I can't do that. I have to take all these AP classes. No, you do not. There's plenty of time to be in college when you're in college. Do the enrichment stuff that you can only do in high school right here, right now with us. We will take care of you okay. as a community and have solidarity between the folks in the department and which can help bolster enrollment numbers both ways. I love this is, that you like a said really that. good time to uh, uh, post a reminder that if the guidance counselors are not your best friends, they need to be ASAP. These are the people who can make that happen. At my daughter's high school, um, she was, you know, going through this, but I have to take this and I have to take that. And you're not allowed to change your schedule because you want to only. And I was like, forget that, bro. What do you want to do? Well, I want to play an orchestra also. She's always already playing in jazz band. I also want to play an orchestra, but the counselor said I can't. And I was like, bro, I'm on it. And I messaged her music teacher and I said, you know, you've got a trombonist who would like to be in your orchestra, but the counselors are saying, no, it's against policy. And like two minutes later, she had been enrolled in orchestra because the teacher was friends with the guidance counselor. <laughs> these are the people that can help, help you make these things happen. Yes, absolutely. Um, and the Oh, go gonna, ahead, Ron. I was just going to share the stories over which AP classes or honors classes your students need. That story is really well told by the, the, your students themselves. Mm. You, you know, just have them, have your juniors and seniors mention to your you know, ninth and 10th graders what their schedule is like. Mm -hmm. Have them share their, their thoughts about how, 
how being involved in in music helped them get through their high school years. And I'll Actually, let, I'll, Ron, I'll, that is reminding me of this thing that we did um, when Beth and I were at Washington. We fed Garfield High School, and the um, music department at Garfield at that time was not very collaborative, and the band guy was having trouble matriculating kids through band and the common tale was but i have to take these other classes you can't take band for four years so i might as well just quit now so what we did is had some students write out a sample schedule of what like how you can do it here's uh -huh. Just mm -hmm. like if you just want to do sort of the minimum, all this way scaled up to I want to take every AP course that's offered and showed how you could get all your requirements and still take music, in this case band, for all four years. And mm -hmm. it really helped. This is something yeah. kids can help you with. And that's kind of along the lines of, you know, being willing to be collaborative and being willing to go there to support, even though you might be like competing a little bit with your colleagues, um, but really getting through a, a tough time, like having a cut, being, um, being rift, being, uh, having your program changed or consolidated, all of these things, it takes a real careful attitude adjustment. Um, and right now I want Lynn to talk a little bit. Um, Lynn, share with us, for those of us that are hurting, like those of us that are, we've suffered a cut, we feel really crappy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's okay, um, it's okay to feel that way especially um I, I do think we in i mean i think any teacher would internalize it but i think particularly you know we we as music educators we are so invested in our students and in the music making and in our programs um it's okay to to take a second and to take care of yourself right as school winds down this year if it has already for you it's okay to step away for a moment and just just chill just you know maybe get out of the space to take a breather. Um, and then once you're ready, think about how you want to engage. Because you you can engage. It's up to you in terms of how you want to do it, right? And um, as Jeremy and I were riffing earlier and Beth and Kelly were, were showing off, who are your collaborators going to be? Mm -hmm. Who are your partners going to be in this work? Um, and start talking to them. Um, how are they feeling? Um, what would they like to see? Um, maybe share out some of the great ideas that we've heard from the last segment. Um, are there different ways to rebuild the program or to reposition the program? Um, are there resources that have been shared out from this webinar that help you make a, a more effective case, either from the business aspect, as Jeremy began us with, or from the structural aspect of seeing students all the way through the K-12 system, through the success of a music program? Um, any of these might work for you, but it's you're going to need to sort of figure out what that is. And part of that's going to be listening to what your administrators and your policymakers say, as well as your community members. How are they talking about the issues being faced in your school and in your school district? And then how do you get to position your music program as part of the solution? Mm -hmm. Right? So if budgets are tight, you might be part of the solution because your orchestra is 80 pieces, which means you're one teacher taking care of multiple, what would actually be multiple classrooms at a given point in time. Right? Mm -hmm. they, right? That, that would be one approach. If people are really concerned about student engagement, there is plenty of research to show how um, having music programs gets kids to school and keeps them engaged in school, um, right? Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of test scores, just the fact that they can come and make music means they're going to come to school, which means they're going to learn in other, <laughs> other classes because they're there, because they want to be there. Um, yeah. So you need to think about what that what are the needs and then how can we be part of that solution for that need? And there are some great resources Again, many thanks to our colleagues at Music for, Art, for, Music for All, sorry, um, consolidating those all into a resource document for you. But um, uh, NAFME, the National Association for Music Education has a great sort of local advocacy action plan. You can go then start to build out, build out the plan based on what you've heard um, and you know keep your ensemble together 
get all your advocates together, figure out who's going to do what type of work. And just like you would do in your classroom, right? You try something out, you critique it, reflect on how it went, um, and then you you make it better and go continue forward. Um, so uh, again, these are all the skills that you have to have to be a successful music educator. You're just shifting them now into this sort of community action space. Um, but you, you know how to do it. It's just figuring out how to take care of yourself and then how and where um, and why you're going to engage in this work in the community. And just like reaffirm yeah. that, that you love what you do, that you love music, you love kids, you love teaching kids music and, sh and building community around that. And also reaffirm that you are an educator and you are a learner and you can get in there and you can learn with the kids and build community that way. You're going to build a coalition that is too strong to be stopped. Yeah. And it, and, and it's maybe okay it's, it's okay to time. let go. It's okay to maybe let go of wearing the tails <laughs> yep. and waving the stick around for a little yeah. while. Maybe it's okay to shift into some guitar classes or ukulele class. Or you go sit in the back of the band and let your kids direct it and conduct. Sure. Right? Yes. You know, Play. Like, get your ax out. Right. Yeah. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes being able to be part of the music making helps refresh us too. Right. And mm -hmm. gives our kids totally. an additional leadership opportunity. Mm -hmm. Totally. And um, that actually is, I'm, I'm really glad that Mallory switched the slide because that makes me think about, um, you know, our opportunities as educators to get together and um, just be with each other, first of all, um, and learn from each other and um, get pep talks from each other and network with each other and collaborate with each other. And when the question, how can we help? When I think about WMEA, how can we help? I invite people to come and be a part of our organization so that we can work together, so that we can learn together, hang together, commiserate together, and create new Brainstorm ideas. Brainstorm together. Brainstorm that yeah. new ideas. Um, create a, a whole new world. Move music education forward. Um, be a part of your associations. If you're a string teacher, join ASTA. Um, there is a whole world of things going on at ASTA. ACDA, um, general music organizations. Um, tap into your community and what's happening. Places like Seattle Jazz Ed, they want to come to your classroom. They want to get your kids involved. They want to be a partner in you rebuilding what's going on. Um, music for We also all. have a lot of resources that we created during the pandemic for our own online classes, but they're ready for teachers to use in their own classrooms as well. Like there are a lot of materials that exist. Hop on over to the Music for All website. See what's going on. Check out all of the resources that their team put together. Um, a, a literal toolbox for you. You know, one other tool that we have uh, available is called Advocacy in Action. You can go to advocacy.musicforall.org, and it has folks from around the country and shining a spotlight on great local advocacy efforts. So there's the Advocacy in Action Awards where folks submit, and then uh, there's a committee that chooses uh, to recognize in six categories like uh, recruitment and retention, decision maker interaction, these types of things that are just good ideas. But what the website has is here was the project, here's how they did it, here are some artifacts like PDFs and videos, et cetera. So you can go look at it and go, all right, well, I can't do that, but I think I could do this with it. And I would also encourage folks- Borrow uh, away, right? <laughs> yes. Bar borrow from those who've already been successful, yep. Yes. And I don't believe there is a person on this webinar or that will watch this in the future that hasn't had some success somewhere doing something with their kids and community that you can make an application to so that your resource can become a national resource, your idea can become a national resource for folks. Please apply so that we have those ideas 
to share and for others well, to share. I was going to say something about that, like how you might be sitting here right now um, watching this webinar and you might be thinking, oh man, I got some great ideas. Um, so I have two things to say to you. Type it in the chat, A, um, so that we can see it and hear about it. But also, and two. A two, I want <laughs> you to feel empowered to be pre a presenter. Do apply to go to conferences. Go to the conferences. Be a presenter. You would actually be shocked how few people apply for conferences. I didn't I know. know. I always felt so VIP when I was selected. But as it turns out, like, I was probably selected because no one else applied. <laughs> Probably maybe not, a little probably. bit of both. Yeah. Maybe a but, little bit of both. Uh, but I mean, I'm just saying, like, we are all we all have the power to be leaders. We all have the, the power to be like powerful creators. And um, just along with the elevator speech, I want you to be comfortable with the ask. Um, you have a voice. Yeah, you, you have, have a voice. voice. Um, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to sit here with Jeremy and Lynn tonight if somebody didn't have the guts to get on an email and just simply ask, are you available to do this? Are, would you be able to help? And the answer was yes. The worst thing that can happen is that they say no. And <laughs> that's really not that bad. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, go for the gold, make the ask, get help, get help in your advocacy. And when you are dreaming of ideas, cool things start happening. The snowball starts rolling down the hill and gathering size and scope. I have and a story pretty... that I have to tell right now. Okay. Beth, it's going to kill you. Well, for it, what made me think of it? <laughs> as I'm sitting here in my laundry room so I can be right next to the router. Uh, yeah. Everyone else is like, for those of you who are listening and not watching, um, folks are looking very profesh with headphones in like their <laughs> studio. And I am in my laundry room. So that's what's happening here. Uh, because Kelly is pretty, um, I'm not really into the tech. Don't really like the technology very much kind of old school. I drive an old car, you know, all that stuff. Anyway, <clears throat> when Beth and I, it was our first year teaching together. And that year, the Seattle school district moved from um, an open enrollment plan where kids would select just people could go whatever. It was like the wild west. You could go to whatever school you wanted in the district. And so families who were passionate about music would come to our school. It was a sweet gig, real sweet. And then they moved, they um, moved, cut 11 schools, just closed them and moved to a, a neighborhood school plan, which families loved, of course. Um, and it meant that 60% of our students were just pulled up and moved to a different school and those resources too. And we were really worried about keeping FTE. It was my first year in the district. So I was probably going to get riffed and um, it was really scary, traumatic time. And some, uh, you know, in some of our booster meetings, we were brainstorming about what to do. And it was decided that a little video, which you can still find on YouTube, That's uh, right. was created, but not by me because I'm not into the tech. Some kids did it. And yesterday in the car, my daughter said, oh, mom, I have something funny to show you. One of my friends found and she pulls up her phone and it's the video called Music, Music is, is Cool, cool at, at Washington, Washington Middle School. school. <laughs> That was our recruiting tool. And so, uh, right. it might have worked a little bit because we were just. It got some mileage. It got, it some, got some mileage. mileage. And we, we rebuilt we that program and FTE. it was better than ever. It better was than the ever. The program yeah. was better than ever. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah. we are at the Q and A point, and um, we've got a couple of questions that have come up from our um, wonderful viewers. And question number one, and I'm just going to throw this out: the person who has something to say first wins. Why is this topic <laughs> important to talk about? What topic? Advocacy, because our kids matter, okay. because music matters, yes. because music in our communities is a total game changer, because it changes, saves and changes lives. Simply put. Um, <clears throat> music is good for our hearts and our souls and brings us together. One thing that I wanted, we didn't circle back, but Jeremy mentioned the... Um, uh, it's called advocacy in action. Is that correct, Jeremy? What I love about that is it's those ideas there. And it's, if you haven't seen that, it's fantastic. You should go hunt around, hunt and peck and just check some of those ideas out. Those ideas are not necessarily about tragic kinds of things related to advocacy, right? They're just simple things to help promote. And so it's not, it's, they're not, it's not necessarily advocacy in a crisis. Right. Advocacy is all the time. Right. And Advocacy, so that, I think this question here, why is this topic important is because Beth, you just said it. Advocacy is all the time. Yes. You're in a, a world of continuously changing district and state priorities. Uh, and I'll just give you an example. Beth and uh, Kelly, you guys, I think Kelly was your example of getting to know your counselors, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, there was a time when I was teaching high school and they said, okay, we're looking at the international baccalaureate program and bringing that in. Well, there's only so much curricular time in the day. So what we did was we got in front of it, got, got on board with it and said, IB means in band. And we recruited kids out of elementary school through band. The band directors became certified in IB music. We became their mentors for their uh, extended essays. We use uh, marching band and other things as uh, CAS hours so that, you know, essentially what I'd say is it won't take you too much more time to do one or the other and kind of figure out how to tell that story. And who knows what the next thing is going to be that happens. And that is why music advocacy is crucial so that our students are able to have the same things that we did, that folks before did, and the folks before did. And the fact is, this gets off the uh, topic a little bit. You have to learn to play the oboe basically the same way today as you did 200 years ago, and you're going to have to do it 200 years from now. And we are the stewards in between that get them to the next 200 years. And I mean, and I know usher, this is a little... Go ahead. I was going to say, and usher in modern styles of music as well. Um, it's both, you know? I, I mean, I think obviously that... Um, um, music organization hosting a, a webinar about music teaching. Like we aren't covering the why is music important thing. We don't, I don't think this group needs that, but maybe your community does. And Jeremy's got a ton of info um, on those talking points. I'm really a mute, like an art for art's sake kind of a thinker. Mm -hmm. I just think it's what we should just all have music, but not yes. everyone thinks that way. And also like a lot of other subjects are mandated, right? They're the core subjects. You, you can't cut math or science. There are only so many hours in the day. There are only a couple of classes that are going to get chopped when there's budget cuts and they're the electives and the electives are the arts and foreign languages at most schools. And so it doesn't, we, we have to have the right words to fight for our jobs and not, not just so that we ourselves are employed, but so that our kids and our communities have it. access to what I think is like a fundamental human right. Lynn, Kelly, I, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I would say that in all of my years of doing advocacy, whether walking the halls of, you know, Congress or 
um, with state legislators or school board members. I don't know if I've ever met anyone who was anti-music. Um, they are trying to figure out how to, like we are, how to fit it all in the day, how to fill it all, as Jeremy said, with the changing priorities that might be coming down on top of them or that they're hearing from constituents are important. Um, and so again, how can your music program be part of that solution? Um, because, and then you go and say, because you know how important music is, right? And they're all gonna go, mm -hmm. yeah. And they're gonna tell you the story of how music touched their lives or how important it is to their grandkids mm -hmm. or how um, a music teacher was you know, so important for the kid down the street. So give them that opportunity to share their story, but you gotta be part of the solution of the issue that they're facing. And, and that's gonna take some yeah. creativity. Yes, yeah. that's awesome. And, um, you know, music is a viable career path too. And so we need to um, stand by that. A, a person can be a musician or work in the music industry and make a living. Um, and that is why we can advocate that it is also a core subject for some for, for, mm -hmm. all, for many kids. Um, so right now on the screen, you can see the resources page. Um, and there are several resources that can be accessed via the Music for All um, Facebook and LinkedIn profiles um, and on the WMEA page and on the WMEA website. Um, it's kind of like a toolbox um, if you will, um, open these things up, read them at your leisure, and I'm sure that you're going to be able to find things that you can add to your elevator speech and add to your coalition building. Um, and I'd love for Jeremy to talk a little bit about some of the things in there. Sure. Uh, immediately, though, Beth, I'm reacting to what you just said, that there are so many careers. It is a viable career path, you know, workforce yes. development. Music and arts and performing arts, huge. Uh, in fact, Ben Zolkauer, if you're listening, uh, please get permission to drop Bob Morrison's instrumentalist article from last April in that talks about, and I believe I'm quoting this correctly, nationally, baccalaureate music education majors have a 100% placement rate. Lynn, am I correct about that? That's correct. And That's I don't correct. know about you, but I've got a 14 year old. I want them to go to a school and have that degree pay off. So heck yeah. So um, <laughs> kind of um, on uh, on a slightly different topic, but very important. Um, Lexi, who is watching right now, asks if anyone can quickly before we um, before we wrap up speak about how to advocate on the district level and things we can do to support change beyond our own building. So I'll, I'll jump in and I know others will have things to add. Um, first, go, go and listen. If you haven't gone to a school board meeting before, go to a school board meeting. What are they talking about? What are they concerned about? What's the language they're using? Um, how are they thinking about the system that is the school district that they're in charge of running? Um, get to know the, if you have an arts coordinator at the district level, get to know that person. If not, get to know the superintendent that's in charge of curriculum and instruction. Again, go meet with them. What are they working on? What are they hoping for for the next school year? How is music and how are the music programs part of that? How are they envisioning it? They may never have talked about music with anyone before. Go talk to them. Tell them what you're doing, and, but more importantly, mm -hmm. listen to what their needs are and how you are part of the, the success story of the school district. Jeremy, what else? I'm sure you've got more. I'm being told by Mallory Duncan, our director of communications, that it is time to hand it to Beth to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that is also <laughs> fine, but I'm going to stick, um, I'm gonna stick something in there before we uh, close out. Um, I just urge all of us to lean the heck in. You should insert yourself into the situation. Be at the board meeting. Join up and be a part of your NEA. Be a leader. Be helpful. Be helpful. Go be a part of your school's building leadership team. Um, lean in. Use your voice. Use your brain power because you're very creative. And um, that way you will find that you are building the solution. You are building the solution. Um, we want to thank our partners, 
today for joining WMEA for this wonderful conversation, which could go on forever and ever. <laughs> um, and we just we, got started. <laughs> yeah, we just got started. And we urge um, folks to reach out to any of our entities to ask questions and um, help us um, help us help you. Um, and so thank you to all for attending and please check out those resources on the resource link. I'm a little Everybody sad have a we're great done.